All right, good morning and welcome on a wet uh, San Francisco Saturday. So my name is Jan Rabai, as was mentioned, and let me see if this works. Uh, I've been uh, a faculty at Berkeley for uh, quite a while. I became emeritus about four or five years ago, but still enjoy basically being engaged in lecturing and giving presentations. So my area of expertise is basically looking at weird things, uh, things kind of pushing boundaries. That's always been kind of my ma uh, mantra in life. But these days, actually, I think I feel like I'm a storyteller, uh, basically trying to uh, get people excited about technology, get excited about the opportunities that are there. And that's what I hope to do today. So before I go in the topic of this lecture, let me first put things a little bit more in perspective, the whole day, actually, in perspective. Um, it is amazing, right? So if you look at it, chips are basically everywhere. Uh, it's amazing how in six decades, this idea of an integrated circuit has overtaken the world in a way. Just to give you a number, the number of transistors that's produced yearly is equal to the, or actually larger than the number of grains of sand uh, in the world on our whole planet. Think about that. That's amazing. You look at the number here, 10 to the 18 transistor produced every year. And they go everywhere. Right? A lot, obviously, a lot of them go into those big data centers or basically compute centers that are basically sparkle over the world, filled up with large number of processors. But that's only one part. More and more they have come into our daily life, to mobiles first, these uh, things we all carry with us and they're basically our source of information. And then ultimately to all those sensors that are spread around in our environment, cameras, security, uh, traffic, you name it, IoT, the edge. So we see basically uh, chips everywhere in our daily life and impacting society in a big way. Now, if you think about those chips, what they do, you always think first of all about computing, right? And computing obviously takes a lot of those transistors, but it's not the only thing. If you look again at the picture I show you here, we see that actually computing is definitely everywhere, but there's other tasks we perform. There's wearable device or portable device with us are communicating devices. They network together. They exchange information. And then on the other side, these things that are sprinkled to the world acquire information, sensors and uh, actuation devices that impact the physical and the biological world. So three functions, compute, communicate, and acquire, act. So this is exactly what is going to be reflected in the lectures today. My first lecture about digital computing is mostly about compute. But then we have a lecture about uh, sensing. Oops, wrong button. And a a basically a lecture about basically communication. Now, the big picture I showed you with the virtual world and the physical world is actually reflected in many different layers. Every single device that we're carrying with us right now also has all those components. It communicates, it computes, it acquires. Think about your cell phone, think about the watch you're wearing, it has all those components in it. And on top of that, it has to find out where to get the energy. So there's batteries and power management and so on and so forth. We're not gonna talk about that today, but you're gonna be see basic, basic presentations about all three other aspects of basically our uh, uh, compute nodes. Oops, this is strange. Okay, so this lecture, digital, lecture two, sensing, lecture three and four are gonna be about communication. All right, that's kind of the big picture. So let's now zoom in on compute, right? It is amazing, right? Um, digital computing is a amazing success story. And just to give you an idea how successful this is and how it changes perspective, a, the most advanced chips you can buy today uh, like, for instance, the Dojo processor from uh, uh, Tesla or some of the NVIDIA processors these days have about 80 billion transistors, 80 billion transistors on a single die. Now, this you can buy for about $500, maybe $1,000 approximately. Right? So huge complexity at very low cost. Now, let me compare that to other systems that I know of and see how they fare. So a car, you buy, say, a cheap car, $25,000, has about a couple of 10,000 components. 
uh, one of those uh, very expensive steppers we're using right now to produce chips, cost $100 million and has about, um, you know, about 500,000 components in it. Uh, a most advanced plane maybe has a complexity of a couple of million components and it costs you $250 million. The only system that I know that is equivalent to those chips of today is our human brain, which has 80 billion neurons. And I don't know how much it would cost to buy one of those things. I kind of put a price at it, but ultimately it shows you that this is about the only system that I know that's at that same level of complexity. So you wonder yourself is how can we produce something that is very low cost and that's operational and basically correct almost from the first time. So we have billions of devices integrating complex configurations, mostly working correctly from the first time on and long thereafter. They run those chips run for decades very often. So what's the secret behind it? What's the secret behind the success of this digital design paradigm? And that's what I'm going to focus on. Now, I know a lot of you have probably taken some digital class or an architecture class somewhere already. And I'm not going to uh, use so you know the background. What I'm going to do is focus on some key principles, fundamentals that basically make that approach so successful. That's really what it's going to be all about. All right. So first principle, model of computation. That's important. Um, our digital circuits are all based on one computational concept, which is basically Boolean algebra. An algebra that is very complete, that allows you basically to, once you have it established, you can do anything with it. You can implement every single computational function. So basic idea, you have a algebra, which has two elements, zero and one. Uh, bits, basically, we call them. And we have three operations, and or and, 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 or, and not. And with those, you can basically implement every single logical function. And uh, based on top of that, that very well-defined and crisp and clear algebra, we can build all kinds of things. We can do optimization, we can do manipulation, you can find tools that operate on them. You actually can do virtually everything. So that's the first step, and that's important because it really defines very clear what you're trying to accomplish. Now, once you have that world of ones and zeros, when you have that Boolean algebra, then it can start layering things on top of them. I can combine those functions into more complex operations, like arithmetic. I can do multiply, addition, I can do a square root, whatever. And I also can do control. I can basically figure out, find the state machines. If this happens, then you do this, and so on and so forth. So once you have those, then the next thing on top of that is, well, I can build processors, microprocessors, or other processors, single processors, all this kind of thing that do company computation. And on top of that, then I can write software. And once you're in the software world, everything is possible. I right? call it a fairyland of software, right? So it is all based on the fact that we are having that algebra at the bottom, ones and zeros. Now that's kind of cool and that's great, but ultimately that doesn't tell us how to build it. Right? It's a great concept, it's a virtual idea, but you need to somewhere link this to a physical device that I can operate on. Now, so we need the link between this logic and the physical world or the physics that below that. Now, there's many ways of doing this. Uh, I, what I need is something that represents a one, something that represents a zero, right? That's the basic thing we're looking for. So we can say, well, maybe I could use charge or I could use a voltage or current or flux, whatever you have in terms of signals you can manipulate. And you say, okay, I take one value, that's a one, another one, that's a zero. And once I have that, we basically are rolling. Now, most of the time we're gonna use voltage because it works really well with the devices we have. So you can do computation with current, you can do computation with flux, but right now voltage is the premier way of doing things. So what I can do is say, well, I pick one voltage as a one, one voltage as a zero, and that's basically the answer. Unfortunately, life is a little bit more complicated. That voltage that you see in the physical world is not very clean, always the same value, but there's noise added to it. Noise that comes from the environment, coupling, supply, other type of thing that basically make that signal kind of bounce back and forth. And if the bouncing is too large, maybe I don't see the difference between ones and zeros that much anymore. So that's a problem. 
uh, you want to have a very clear and crisp one and a very clear and crisp zero. So how do we accomplish that? Well, you could say, okay, take this waveform and I put somewhere a threshold in between. Above the threshold is one, below is a zero, right, as an example. But that's a problem again, is that uh, if your signal is very close to that threshold, it might go up and down and you don't know anymore if it's a one or a zero. So we need some safety. We need to build in something that helps us to make sure that we have a crisp one or a zero. So what we do is um, make it a little bit more complicated. And we say, well, we're gonna basically take some levels. So we say above that level is a one, below that level or below another level, which is called the low voltage, we basically call it a zero. And in between, it's undefined. We have a region that separates the two from each other. Right. Now, obviously, I would like to make that region as small as possible and the region for the high and the low as large as possible. Right. That would be making the best possible circuit I can imagine. Right. So this is how we actually accomplish this. And this is an important slide. So you take, for instance, a single digital gate. And the simplest one I can think of is an inverter, uh, basically with an input X and an output Y. Now, what I can plot for this particular structure is the function, or we call it the transfer function, the output as a function of the input signal in the voltage domain. Right? We're going to be working with voltages. And what you will see in a good gate is that you will see a transfer characteristic which is highly nonlinear. That's really important. So you see a region that's really flat at first, low gain, where you basically when the input is zero, you get a one out. And then you have another region of low gain, which is the high region. Um, again, where a one, very flat, low gain. And in between then you have this very nonlinear characteristic where we actually have vex very high gain. And now the separation between those regions are again the margins that we were talking about before. You say, if I, for instance, put in a zero, but it's kind of noisy, and I feed into this gate, what we see is that we get a clean one out, right? That's beautiful, right? Noise kind of disappears from us, and that's really what makes that digital design principle so powerful. And in order to deal with it, we are gonna define noise margins. How much noise can I sustain before the thing goes wrong? So your job as a designer is always gonna be to make sure that you never venture out of that safe region because then you have errors and your circuit goes haywire, right? So this is the other kind of key concept of digital is that the circuits are regenerative. I bought this name for it. So I take an input signal, ones and zeros, a waveform, and I add noise to it. Noise come from neighboring signals, wiring, supply, whatever, thermal noise. And I feed it into the gate and because of those nonlinear characteristics, the signal gets cleaned up. We get a very nice clean output signal again, which is beautiful because now I can stack gates on top of each other. I can make complex circuits and noise does not accumulate. Otherwise you have a problem, right? Every time you add another gate, you get more and more noise, you have a problem. So no accumulation of noise, which is in complex circuits. This is, a contrast to an analog circuit, which you might hear about later about. There, if you add things together, noise doesn't disappear. You have to manage it, you have to do design tricks to get around it, but it basically accumulates. So this is one of the beautiful concepts that basically makes digital so successful. All right, so that's one. Now, so far, I've only talked about waveforms. I haven't talked about any implementation yet. So the nice, other nice thing that comes in that we have nowadays with the so advent of the integrated circuit and the, and the transistor, we actually end up with a very beautiful building block. It's a transistor. Transistor is a three terminal device. Most of the time in digital, you can argue about four terminals, but let's make it simple. Three terminals, you have a controlling gate and we have a source and a drain. These are the con other connections. Uh, you can make those things, transistors can be built in many different ways. They have changed over the years. But digital designers don't really care that much about this because you don't want to know exactly what's cooking underneath. You try to ignore it as much as you can. But nowadays, we basically are doing FinFETs, which are really beautiful devices. Now, in the digital world, that transistor, which is, again, a very nonlinear device, actually can be abstracted away in a very simple model, in a very simple representation. It's called a switch. 
when that gate voltage is one, the gate, the switch is closed and we have zero resistance between the source and the drain in the ideal world. When the gate voltage is zero, the switch opens up and we have infinite resistance between the source and the drain. So an ideal switch. And that's the basic building block we're basically going to use to build those billions and billions of transistors, basically complex circuitry. So a ideal switch. Now, the nice thing, another nice thing that happened over time is that we don't only have a single switch as a basic building block, but you also have the complement of it. A, a switch that actually behaves just the opposite way. When the gate is one, the switch is open. When the gate is zero, the switch closes. Okay? So the opposite. Uh, that's what's called CMOS, where you have a switch and a complementary switch. And with those two, when I start stacking them on top of each other, I can build a beautiful inverter, a very simple inverter, two transistors, with actually, if I would have an ideal switch, would have an amazing transfer function. It basically has a region of zero gain, a region of infinite gain, and a region of zero gain. The perfect digital gate I can imagine. Right? And, but it's, this looks ideal, and it is, but actually reality is darn close to it. It is a very good switch. Okay? So... That's basically the advantage. Now I can combine those things and I can build basically anything. Once I have switches, I can combine them in many different ways. I can make all kinds of OR, AND, NAND, NOR, XOR, adders, you name it. You can build them all. So it realizes every, every single logical function I can think of. Okay? So that's cool for functionality and guarantee. So, so far we basically say, well, if I have enough noise margin, I can really get this ideal abstraction. Now, Unfortunately, that transistor is not as good as I showed you. It actually is, has some non-idealities to it. Um, if you think about it, first of all, that on resistance that I said would be zero is not zero. It's a couple of kilo ohms, right? It's a, it's a, there's a finite on resistance. And that off resistance that should be infinity is not really infinity, it's a high number, but it still basically does mean that we don't have a complete open circuit. We have maybe something like a couple of mega ohms. The other thing that basically happens is that when you look at your switches, at every gate of every terminal, we have some capacitance that are being created because of the fact that the way the transistor behaves, the be transistor function, but also the wiring around it and all the things I connect to have capacitance. And those non-idealities, those parasitics, are going to basically perform or basically impact the behavior of our digital circuit. It's going to set the performance in terms of speed, and those parasitics will also determine the power consumption or the energy consumption of your design. So that's kind of the functionality determined by the switch, but basically performance and energy is basically determined by those parasitics. Okay. Now, just to give you an idea about speed, as I said, what basically our network is a connection of switches that we open and close. And every time you close, you basically or switch a, a, a node of your network. There's a capacitance connect to it. Once you go from zero to one, I have to charge that capacitance. And in the opposite way, I have to discharge it. Now, that charging happens to a resistor. So your current flows, the resistor charge up that capacitor. That is what's setting the performance of your circuit. Your performance is determined by the speed I can basically charge up and discharge capacitance, RC network. Very simple, right? These are very simple equations describing those things. But think again, we have billions of them. So that makes it a little bit more complicated. So as a result of this charging effect is when I create an input and I change the input of a gate, the output will change as well, but it will take some time. There's delay. And delay will basically determine, again, the speed of which I can operate my circuits on. So delay is caused by these RC networks. As I mentioned, the other factor that basically have this capacitance and parasitics around is that it also creates power consumption. Now, power consumption is important because it basically, okay, it's energy from your battery and one thing, but it also might heat up your circuit, all kinds of stuff, right? So analyzing and minimizing power consumption is going to be very important. And again, at the basic, it's a very simple concept. Basic energy is consumed when I basically charge up a capacitor, 
from my supply, I consume energy. And uh, the more often I do that, the more energy I consume, the power is going to go up. Right? Very simple equation, the power of a single switching gate is determined by the capacitance I'm charging times the supply voltage or the voltage swing squared times how often I do this, which is the frequency. Okay, That's what we call the dynamic power consumption is the majority of a well-designed structure is going to go there. There's some other factors, however, that basically cause power consumption. As I mentioned, my switches are not ideal. They open, when they open, they should have infinite resistance, they don't. So there will be a leakage spot between my supply and the ground, which is continuously consuming power as well. And that's something we don't like at all. It basically consumes power, wastes it, but it's a, what we call the static power, the standby power, and so on and so forth. So minimizing that is going to be very important. So, but the bottom line is that you can see that for my simple logic digital network, I actually can come up with function, but now I also can come up with some equations or some parameters that determine power dissipation and delay and speed. Okay? So, more complexity added to it, but again, very simple. Now, here's some other important concepts that really make digital design so uh, basically successful. It's called modularity. It basically means that if I basically get, let's say I take two functions. I build a first network, that's function F1, and then another function F2 behind it. So the total function is going to be F2, F1 that I basically implement. Now, the interesting part is that I can put these things together and analyze the power consumption and the delay by just adding the delay of the first block and the delay of the second block. Very additive. You don't have to peer inside the block to figure out what the other one is going to be doing. So we can actually create a very modular design strategy where you take basic building blocks, you add them together, and you have a very simple way of evaluating the delay and the power consumption. So the way we do design typically is we have a library of blocks, uh, AND gates, NAND gates, NOR gates, whatever, uh, adder blocks, and then we're going to combine them together to build more complex entities, like Lego, in a certain sense. And that's a very beautiful thing, that you actually can just build complex things by combining structures together. Now, the other one that's important is in that class is uh, that it, pretty much a result of the same thing, is that we have something that's called hierarchy. What I can do is I take my block F1 and F2, I have a combined function, and I can replace it by a new function. F, which is the combination of the two, but which also has now a delay and a power equation connected to it. So I can raise my abstraction levels gradually to go to higher and higher levels of function without having to worry below what's there, the, the NAND or the NOR structure. So it is called hierarchy, and it helps you to handle complexity. So modularity and hierarchy are very important concepts in the design of digital structures. And that's why we can think about these very complex processors without having to worry, oh, where's that NAND gate, NOR gate, and so on and so forth. All right. One last thing, uh, an important one. Um, so far, I've considered all my functions as basically being static entities. I apply an input, and I get an output. Right. In reality, things are dynamic. Inputs are changing, and outputs are changing, and so on and so forth. Now, if I look at, let's say, the single waveform on top here, it's a voltage waveform, it's been a bit slow for a while, and then it goes high. Now, I don't really understand what this represents. For the same thing, this could be a zero followed by two ones and a zero, or it could be two zeros followed by four ones and two zeros. I don't know. How do you interpret this? Uh, that's a challenge. And if you now start combining with other signals, you need to have somewhere a reference. So basically say, when are things changing? When should we evaluate functions? When are things going to be stable? Right? That's what we need to know. So you need somewhere a concept of time. Now, there's a couple of ways of doing, dealing with time. One of them is say, well, I'm only going to look at something changes at my input. If nothing changes, everything remains the same. Uh, it's only when I change that I evaluate basically what's going on. Right? It's called an event. Every time you have an event, you evaluate what's going on, and then things get stable again, you don't do work at all for a while. This is what's called asynchronous design. Asynchronous design is when you basically compute with events, and timing is determined 
in a relative way by the relationship between those events. Um, great concept, hasn't been that successful. Um, it's a little bit complicated because these things go on its own, it's hard to verify and so on and so forth. So most of the designs we're doing today have a different approach. They say, well, let's define time. And how do you define time? Well, I know how it works. You have a clock. Right? You have a clock there that basically tells you this is the time and now everything is gone and now we evaluate and so on and so forth. And that's the way digital design works today. We have a clock signal that's generated somewhere of the chip. You have a crystal, whatever. There's something that's kind of stable and very, very well defined. And it's only at, at the rising edge or the falling edge of the clock, I say, well, now we have a clocking event. We're going to evaluate what the values are of our various signals. So this means that once you have that rising edge of your clock, every signal should be stable. It cannot be transitioning between 0 and 1 because then you don't know what you get. You get something undetermined. So the rule now is here we have our clock. The clock defines clock events, and we're going to make sure that the whole circuit can be evaluated on that clock event. Okay, so that's uh, called synchronous design. And again, is the underlying concept of virtually all the digital design. 99.9% .9 is done in a synchronous mode. Now, how does this kind of work? Well, um, you now can imagine that we have our logic blocks, F1, F2, what we talked before, and we're gonna add some gatekeepers. Gatekeepers are the ones that basically are the ones that basically say, when can my inputs change, right? So when you have a rising clock event, that thing which is called the gatekeeper is called a register or a latch. You can find different names for it. That thing will basically, once the clock edge, you're basically going to apply the new inputs to the logic function F. It computes for a while, and you want to make sure that it's finished and ready to be evaluated at the end of that clock period, at the next rising edge of your clock. So that basically helps you to do a couple of things. It basically, the, those registers are basically the ones that basically store the signals and pass it on to the next gate on the clock event. And it enables um, uh, completion function. It basically, once your clock edge happens, everything has to be stable. And it also orders the event. It basically says, now you do this, now you do that, now you do that. That's really what the clock does, okay? So for us to have a working design, we need to make sure that the clock period, the periodicity of your clock has to be larger than the delay of the blocks in between their latches. That's another constraint that we basically define. Remember the noise margins we had defined? Here we have another constraint. We have to make sure that our clock is not too fast, uh, otherwise you have indeterminate signals. Okay, so synchronization is another key concept that makes digital design work. Now, unfortunately, um, things are not as beautiful. Like again, with the noise margins, we have your signal that's nice, Z1 and zero, but then you have noise and it goes up and down, right? Same thing here, that clock signal is not really ideal. It would be nice to have the same clock signal everywhere, that you basically have a, everything, every part of your chip understands the same concept of time. The problem is that I wire that clock. It's a wire, it's a, it doesn't come out of the blue. It has to be wired. That wire has delay as well. So every single of your gatekeepers might have a different perception of time as, uh, because it's a little bit delayed and you're gonna have to deal with that. The other thing that can happen is that your clock signal itself can be noisy as well. You generated the, that clock edge that basically normally should always happen at the same time, jitters back and forth. It's an uncertainty and uncertainty is bad, right? We wanna have determinism, we wanna have clear Distribution. So the way we're going to do this by saying, well, we know this Q, which is that delay of the clock between different elements. We can compute that. We know the jitter. We can try to minimize the jitter on the clock. But that's basically overhead, right? So we're going to make sure that we provide timing margin. Remember, our period has to be larger than the delay of the largest block. We add some, certain, some margin to it because of the fact there can be noise on the clock. So timing margin. And uh, we try to basically uh, define them in such a way, obviously that's overhead, right? If you make my margins too big, my circuit is gonna be too slow. I have to accommodate for that. So you try to make your timing margins as small as possible. And this is obviously a big component. Now you think about this, millions of registers and flip-flops on a chip, 
I want to make sure that for every flip-flop, you never basically are going to uh, basically uh, violate the rule I gave you about the delay has to be smaller than the clock periodicity. Clock periodicity uh, basically augmented with that timing margin I was talking about. So timing margin is not a very important thing. So I'm not going to talk about this. I talk primarily about logic. You can, I can talk another hour about memory. Memory is a very important part as well. And the beauty of CMOS and MOS transistor is that we have a number of different ways of storing data. Uh, you can do it basically using pure logic. When you take two inverters, cross-couple them together, we get a, a memory cell, something that remembers the value. And it's very fast. It can be built inside your logic. But there's other ways. We can store charge on a capacitor, or we can do some physical things that allow us to remember things for a longer period of time, like flash memory. Um, again, I'm not going to talk about that. Just I wanted to mention that this is something that is very important in our digital design world as well. And we have a rich family of basically structures. OK, so here we are. So what does it take to do design? Well, I first of all going to basically come up with functionality. I'm going to define a set of functions. And I'm going to make sure that they do the right function, the right computation for the task at hand. Right? So you can check that. You can simulate it. You can verify that. Uh, you basically do, you apply, you, you basically create a simulator, analyze the thing, you see if it's the right function coming out. The second thing you have to do is make sure that you never, once you start implementing it using transistors, that you meet your noise margins, that you don't have signals or noise coming in that basically can negatively impact your circuit. The next thing you need to do is make sure that you don't violate those timing margins. So violation of timing margin can make your circuit to fail. So we have a set of tools. So the design process basically is check, check, check. You're done. You get a result that basically is going to be functional. It might not be the right thing. It might not be fast enough yet. There might be too much power. So you can do some optimization on it. You look at this. Well, if I change it this way, I change my supply voltage a bit. I can do that. I can basically get something that performs better. So you have a, a loop where you basically keep on optimizing and you get better and better and ultimately say, okay, I'm done. I can tip it out. And the beauty of this now is that if you do all those checks and or your manufacturing fab doesn't mess it up, this thing is going to work, guaranteed. And that's really the beautiful thing about it, right? So you actually can indeed design complex things, getting 80 billion transistors out, and they come back and they all work. Amazing. But it is a very simple set of checks because of the fact that we indeed work with a very clear uh, type of uh, uh, algebra. All right. So now, that's cool, but wait a second, right? It sounds too easy, and it is. Because um, all those checks take time. And if, it's only, if only have a single multiplier adder to deal with, I can go and check everything out. But you have billions of transistors. So this is going to take a long time to do that verification. So we need to come up with ways to speed this up. And that's the next thing that I want to talk about, how to deal with complexity. At this point in time, I would just like to take a little break and see if there's any question about the materials so far. Yes? So this is about me and my computer. So how do you with the group of designers of like and talk to the people of bigger audience for this aside from providing sufficient framework? Because I understand with SKUs, you can optimize it across distribution network, but I was mm -hmm. wondering if I was wondering if uh, similar measures existed for minimizing jitter impact. Yeah, so uh, jitter comes from a set of sources, right? It, it, it actually is generated not in one place, but it actually can come from very different parts of your circuit. The clock itself, the generator of the clock, already very often produces jitter. It's an oscillator, and that oscillator will basically be impacted for instance, by supply noise, by the variation, and so on and so forth. So the clock source itself is very important, and make it as clean as possible and making sure that you don't mess it up too much when you basically do the wiring is the first step. Now, jitter can also come from other sources. Like if I put a number of wires close to each other, and one changes, the capacity coupled between the two will impact the other one as well. So that basically can cause your clock to basically have jitter. Uh, temperature variation, there's a whole bunch of sources of jitter that can happen. 
the way to deal with it ultimately there's it's a random variable right it's a random variable and what you want to do is minimize the variance basically of that random variable that's really what you're trying to do so there's some tricks in layout generation for instance clock distribution that can help you to prevent some of that additional noise that i'm adding into so for instance if i run two wires and i run them parallel for a long period of time or for a long distance i'm going to get a lot of capacity between those that is going to cause a coupling between the two creates basically you know, so in your layout generation, what you can make sure is that you don't have wires running too close to each other. Um, adding buffers is another way. Uh, there's a number of different ways of playing around with this type of thing. But, but yeah, j jitter is a fairly fundamental skill we can play around with. Uh, you can um, ultimately, if I, I, can, I can try to make zero skew, skew between every register by putting a lot of buffers in between. But jitter is something that really is somewhere fundamental and what you can only do as much because you know there's going to be some noise in your circuitry as well. But you have to take it into account. And ultimately, when you do your timing analysis, you want to make sure that you never violate those jitter type constraints. Okay? Any other question? Yes. Okay, I heard that... Um Asynchronous design is not really popular because they don't really have the EDA tools to mm -hmm. um, test and verify yeah. it. How worth it do you think it would be to develop those tools? Mm -hmm. Very good question. And I've been asking myself that same question for many, many years. Uh, ultimately, the problem right now is that the whole f design methodology and flow that's basically being sold and developed by the EDA companies, Cadence, Synops, and things like that, is based on that synchronous approach. It's kind of ingrained in the whole thing, and trying to change that is going to change that flow. Basically, requires quite a bit of tool development. Now, can they be developed? Absolutely, but there has to be an incentive. Uh, people are not going to change their mind until they're basically run against a wall. And the real reason why you would go to asynchronous, there's a couple of reasons for it, is obviously energy. You only compute when you, things are changing rather than having that clock sitting there all the time. And it's also variability. If the timing margins become too big, then uh, I basically have to put too much overhead. In my, so I basically, remember, it's a worst case design approach. You have to look at the worst case timing margin. And if that basically gets too big, you start losing. Uh, actually, this is where asynchronous can play a big role when you have large variance in, the, in, in your operation. So, uh, again, um, I've been asking that qu same question to the CEOs of some of the EDA companies in the past. Said, what would it take for you guys to do asynchronous? So, well, we need to have a very big customer that comes to us and says, I want to get asynchronous design flow delivered to you right now. It has to be a really big customer. So, it hasn't happened so far. Thank you. You're welcome. Good. So what I'm going to do now is go the opposite way. So you have the basics. And now I'm going to say, well, how to deal with that complexity? How are we going to basically deal? So think about it. The Intel 404, the first microprocessor, 1971, had 8,000 transistors. And I can see it is a piece of art. It's handcrafted. Every single transistor was designed by hand and verified by hand. And then to translate into layout, we had the three founders of Intel there, Gordon Moore and, and, and Noyce and, um, and Andy Grove. You see them there, that's the way they actually made the transition to the fab. You take the patterns and you peel them off one by one and you create your transistor using riblets, uh, that kind of weird thing. So this was very labor intensive. It took a lot of people to design 8,000 transistors and make it work. Now think about your Tesla Mojo is a million times more complex. So if we wouldn't have changed our methodology, we would have 10 people times a million, 10 million people designing that particular processor. Now obviously that doesn't work. So the whole question, the whole, the whole story about the success of digital design is that we found a way to improve productivity. How can we make a single designer design more transistors per day? That's really the big question that basically was always arising. And over time, we have seen that we continuously come up with new ways to increase productivity 
of a designer. Um, again, if you think about complexity, if I take that 8,000, we had a simulation tool for verification. It was called SPICE. SPICE is basically takes a transistor model and you put all the transistors and you simulate the waveforms. Now, as you, some of you may have worked around with SPICE doing little circuits, but it doesn't scale to billions of transistors. You have to simulate a complete processor of that complexity. I'm gonna take hundreds of thousands of hours of compute time to get any single result. So verification of your timing margin, noise margins and things like that is gonna be impossible if I stick to that particular transistor level. So we have to raise the abstractions. That's really what it boils down to. Raise abstractions and also come up with some limitations and rules. Rules are gonna be very important if you wanna basically deal with complexity. So the answer to this is what we call nowadays design methodology. Methodology is doing two things for us. It helps us to verify that a particular artifact that I have designed is going to be correct under all circumstances. That's one. The second one is that I want to automate part of the process. I'm not going to design transistors anymore. I want to basically have tools that help me to generate those transistors. So raise the abstraction level and allow us to generate or automate the whole process of getting those transistors down on silicon. So that's the answer really, is what they call design methodology. I'm gonna talk now for the remaining um, 20 minutes or so, I'm gonna talk about basically design methodology. Now, the secret of design methodology, uh, which I really like is what I call, is called freedom from choice. You know, every designer, definitely analog designers, love to do crazy things. So I say, oh, I have this beautiful idea, and I'm gonna do this and that. It never works because it, causes problems, either you violate some rule. And so ultimately, I think the secret is that say, hey, there are some rules that are gonna be implied in you, and if you stick to the rules, it's gonna work, guaranteed, right? That's important. And that's something that was never easy to accept. When you basically had the capability of putting transistors, you could basically do all kinds of things, and, and every possible pattern, so I can shave off a little corner of my layout here or there, I can get a little bit more dense, or I can put a, a gate right there in between the middle of my memory, all the kind of stuff that you would think that people think was smart. Actually, that's not what you should do. Stick to the rules and basically create the rules that make sense it is really the secret of our 80 billion transistor type of approach. So think about productivity improvement, right? So 1970, everything was designed at the transistor level. Um, you put the gate, everything, your whole 80, micro, 80 or 44 microprocessor was designed at the transistor level. Gradually what you do is, well, we're gonna go one step upwards. Why not verify functionality at the logical level? We do our design, we put our gates together, we simulate it, we don't need to really see the transistors. As long as we have an abstraction that's good enough in terms of delay and energy consumption, we can do analyze, analysis at a higher level. Right? And that's really what we're gonna keep on doing, raising those abstraction levels. So design productivity, as the number of transistors a designer has never gone up linearly, but has gone two steps. But every time we adopt a new part of the methodology, we can go to the next step and design more effectively. So uh, again, freedom from choice. Um, this was a landmark, early 1980, late 1970s. It's a book by uh, Carver Mead and Lynn Conway uh, that basically called the VLSI uh, revolution basically started. And it really made a big first step. The first thing they did was define some rules. They say, you cannot do everything in terms of layout. If you wanna basically make something that manufacturable, you're gonna to have to stick to some rules on how you place polygons onto the silicon. Design rules, as we call them. And uh, design rules were initially very simple. You can say, okay, your polysilicon has to be so much far away from that and so on and so forth. So you can push things that close together. Uh, that was, as these are simple. If you look at them today, what the rules for your FinFest are gonna be a lot more complex, but it also, created the possibility of describing a design as a language. And it says a set of polygons. A language that could be generated by a computer. 
So suddenly we basically abstracted away the fabrication process. So if you stick to those rules, and we can check those rules if you stick to them, you're gonna basically make a design that's workable. So this connected between the fab and the designer for the first step of limitation. Um, basically saying um, freedom from choice in a certain sense. So that was the first thing that I think started that whole step upwards in terms of design complexity. And what happened as a result of that, once you have that language, people started doing amazing things. John Oosterhout in, in Berkeley designed that first layout tool that allowed you to basically put things down very effectively rather than having to worry about exactly the rules. It basically ultimately checked on the rules automatically. We started doing logic level simulation. Our sim was one of the first tools. A set of tools that were made publicly available, open source, uh, accessible to everyone. And that created the first wave of designers. People said, hey, actually, if I do this, I can actually generate, once I have that language, I can start writing compilers or tools that compile from a higher level to a lower level and ultimately into an implementation. So that basically, as you can see, by come up with a definition of what is allowable, you enable development of tools that can be shared. Now, the other thing that basically happened at the same time, so while you do, I was, you know, uh, this um, uh, layout generation process, again, I can basically make a tool that basically puts transistors randomly around, and basically like the 8080, uh, for, for the 4004 Intel microprocessor. But actually, if you could limit how, a little bit how you basically can put on your transistors and your gates, you can automate big part of the layout generation process called standard cells. Initially, it was kind of ineffective because the, it, it requires, you had only one metal layer. So wiring was kind of tricky. You had polysilicon, you had wire, metal uh, layer. So you had to put basically the idea of standard cells is that whatever logic function implement, the cells that implement have to be of the same height. And then if I have the same height, they can change the width depending upon the complexity. I can put them into rows and stack the rows on top of each other and then wire the connections between them using a tool. So automatic generation of the layout. Later on, we got more metal layers, so we could avoid having those wiring channels in between and stack the gates very close together. So this is uh, early 80s as an idea. Today, every single design that I know of uses basically standard cells as a way of implementing logic. So this is Again, it, it constrains on what you can do, but it enables you to automate the process. And that's a big thing, okay? So, next thing that was happening, I think in terms of extraction, again, layer, go to another abstraction layer. Um, if you think about it, look back at our synchronous design. What you really are doing is I take values from a register and I do some operation on them and put them back into registers or memory, right? That's really what basic logic does. You transfer information from one register to another one by doing computations in between. So that was cl became clear and people say, okay, we can define a language, a higher level language that describes those type of things effectively. We call them register transfer languages, RTL. Now, the problem, however, was that those languages, that people came up with a bunch of languages, those languages were designed by hardware people. And, you know, they can do amazing things. Hardware folks are amazing, but they're not very good at defining very nice and clear languages. Uh, leave that to the software guys. They really are good at that. They've shown capability, that capability for a while. So what happened in the 80s is that a number of languages emerged. VHDL is one, was pushed by, the by DARPA and the defense community, and Verilog was coming out of the EDA community. We're still stuck with Verilog today. Um, it, is, it is a language which is bizarre. Uh, it requires a lot of learning to get through it, but ultimately, once you got in it, it really helps you to, again, think about design at a higher level of abstraction. So here's an example of uh, Verilog. Um, so it has a couple of components. It can say, well, you can describe a design as a connection of blocks. 
right? That's one way of defining it. It's a net list. I say, I take one block, I put some wiring, create another block, and so on and so forth. But the other approach to the, describe the design is, uh, well, I'm only going to describe what it should do. Behavior. What's the function I'm trying to implement? How you implement it, that's up to the tools to define it. So Verilog combines the two. It has a structural component where you can define, hey, I built something as a connection of blocks, or do you want to have be, be describe behavior? But then for behavior, obviously you need a tool that can translate that behavior into a connection of your cells that you have in your library, right? So that basically is required part of the process. So again, bottom line is that Verilog describes things as a module and you can have structural description or you can have behavioral description and you can layer them on top of each other. Now, here's an important statement. It is not a good language, but it doesn't matter whether it's good or bad as long as it's standard. That was kind of the reason so that everybody agrees on it. You have the tools around it and so on and so forth. We'll come back to that later. Okay, so raising the abstraction level and the because now I have a language like this, I indeed can start thinking about compilers. And it was amazing that actually a group of people managed to basically think about, and again, it's because of the fact that we have that basic concept, which is Boolean logic. You can basically define tools that take a high level function, translate it into gates, and optimize those gates in terms of performance, energy consumption, cost, area, and so on and so forth. So, a really interesting set of tools, very algorithmic. Uh, people really thought long and hard about it, and there's some very beautiful papers that were written late 80s, early 90s, that basically enabled us to indeed start generating complex logic from a higher level description, uh, Verilog and so on and so forth. Um, you can even think higher about that, right? Is, uh, the, for a while, the idea of a silicon compiler emerged the idea that I describe a piece of logic, a piece of function, and it translates it automatically into basically a optimized design. That basically is working. So design is a software process suddenly. Uh, and that's kind of what was a big advantage of how things went forward. So next level, uh, because now again, we're making things more and more complex you start thinking about, well, should I really redesign all my functions all the time? Well, no, right? Uh, if I basically have a, a complex chip, I need somewhere a microprocessor, I need a memory control unit, I need a bus interface, I need external interfaces, input output, um, memory controller, all these kind of things. They are very often similar. You don't have to redesign those things every time around. So they basically are already once you design and verify it is great i can basically reuse it so reuse is a very other very important concept as well you basically design a block once and you try to reuse it over time in multiple designs um, and potentially even you're going to try to reuse it over different technologies technologies don't remain constant every so many years we scale down the transistors make them smaller we put them closer together uh, so if I could find a methodology that basically say, okay, I take that same block and now I put it down, it's going to be working correctly. So reuse is the big frame right now and basically trying to optimize that reuse in such a way that my block maybe is not constant, but it's parameterizable. Let's say I have a processor. Uh, I want to get a 16-bit version for some applications, but other applications, I need a 32-bit version. Can I define basically my block in such a way that it's parameterized and I can fill in a parameter that generates then that block for you? So parameterized based design is very important as well in this reuse space. So um, we have, um, in order to do that, you have to raise the bar a bit, however. Uh, again, as I said, Verilog has been there from the 1980s, it hasn't changed very much, but people have been starting putting some layers on top of that, like system Verilog. But nowadays, what I see happening is that people are getting smarter. So, well, if you basically look at the software world, people use scripting languages. There's all kinds of really beautiful languages out there. Why not use the power of those languages to help me to describe my layout or my design and basically parameterize it? And there's a, a bunch of options out there. You, why not design in Java or Python or TensorFlow 
all those type of things that people are playing around with. And just, so the interesting thing is that it doesn't only describe behavior any longer, but it also defines way of uh, basically, I also acts as a generator. I can make one generator that does a four bit adder, a 60 bit adder, or a very complex adder. I can do it all in one generator type function. So you start combining those things together. Okay, so again, raise the abstraction level. And that's why uh, things like now, like uh, for instance, a RISC-V processor is an example of such a reusable block. Very popular, it's public domain, it's open source, and it basically is very parameterizable. You can basically have various different cores that basically can be defined, but not only that, uh, you can also add next to that blocks that have, you know, again, memory interfaces, memory controllers, accelerators, I want to let a little neural net processor. Well, at Bingo, I have another generator for that neural net processor. Put them all together, lay them together. So again, you start thinking about higher levels of abstraction when you deal with it. You don't think anymore. You don't see gates anymore. You don't see transistors here anymore. Now, um, we come back to that in a minute, though. I, I think it's important that you understand that there's transistors below there. You don't think that this is all magic and all kind of happens automatically. You have to understand what the limitations are. But having the capability of putting things together at this very high level of block level abstraction is really important. And that's why, for instance, if you look at your SOC, system on the chip those days, you see uh, this is an example of the Apple uh, A15 mobile processor. It's 15 billion transistors, but there's clearly defined blocks in there. There's five GPUs. There's two CPUs, there's a neural network core, an NPU that's there that has a number of blocks, memory subsystems, and so on and so forth. And all put together by a size, a fairly sizable group of people, but it's not going to be millions of designers for this thing. Exactly, is you know, if you typical design like that, probably a couple hundred type of people that can design things of this complexity. Again, it's because of reuse, they don't change that CPU every time around. They don't do every single transistor. You try to basically hide them away. Okay, so thinking forward, um, kind of where are we going next? It's always a good thing to ask and, and we can talk a lot about this, but what I start seeing is um, the following thing. Chips design chips. Right? Every generation of, the, of a new chip design is basically computed and designed of a previous generation. I, I always get, and that's why I get more and more complex because my processes become more complex, but the faster, high performance, I can actually do more complex things as a result. So you bootstrap on top of each other, right? Nowadays, if I look at most of the chips that people are designing are AI chips, right? This is where the biggest volume goes in every piece, in the mobile, in the, uh, in the edge, in the data center. So why not use those AI chips to design the next generation chips? So it is already happening. If you look at the EDA company, they're all working on some AI design tools. Help that optimization process. Maybe logic synthesis is, is great algorithmically, but maybe I can put some rules around it that helps to make it effective. Make the pruning of the design space small, uh, more effective and so on and so forth. So AI design tools to me are already happening. There's actually a panel on the, in the conference about that particular topic. But then you might think about, hey, if it really all the chips we're gonna be designing are gonna be AI chips, shouldn't AI design the next generation chips? So there's something to think about is what's the rule of design of tools, AI, and what's the rule of, role of a designer in that whole process? It's gonna be very interesting. But I just want to make you think a little bit about that. Again, the bottom line is what we have done is raise continuously abstraction, and now we're starting to go into basically some behavioral modeling. So that's where things are at, and this is why we can design these very complex chips today. It's quite amazing. So it's a set of principles. Principle of Boolean algebra, noise margins, timing margins, and so on and so forth. Set of uh, rules that we imply in how you basically can basically put things together, like standard cells and logic synthesis and so on and so forth. Now, very clear design methodology. Now, the question is, is the only methodology that works? It's been very successful, right? Now, 
Um, okay, well, I just forgot that. I just the same thing I said, computer design computers. Ultimately, I think we're going to go more and more towards that as well. But again, the, the methodology we have come up with is quite amazing, right? It's been exceptionally successful. It's so I call the ingenuity of humans. Humans that look at complexity and see how they can basically start dealing with that. Now, I don't think that's the only st option, though. Uh, this is not the only success story. Again, if you look at the human brain, it's a successor of nature. Right? You know, this is an amazing computing engine. does incredible things, very adaptive, very first stuff. It has 8 billion neurons, just as many as the transistors we have, and 100 trillion connections between those neurons. And amazingly, it works quite well. Right? It is something that most of the time works quite well um, overall. Now, however, the way that design was structured is completely different than what we have done with our digital design flow. Instead of basically uh, using voltages, we use electrochemical signaling in the brain. It's mostly analog. It's not uh, some, some discrete, but it's an analog machine, really. It's not a digital machine. It's not deterministic. It's actually a statistical engine, and it works with very low noise margins. While we're trying to maximize noise margins here, noise margins are extremely small. It is asynchronous as a design concept. There's no clock in my brain. Uh, it has little modularity. Uh, it's not like here I can build a brain by having something that does a vision, and here's the other thing, and they're all kind of nicely coupled together. It doesn't work. The, the interconnection between those is a lot more complex. And the abstraction, the model of computation, mostly unclear still. We don't really know how it works. So it shows that methodology is really important, um, but there's actually different options that we can think about. And we shouldn't, occasionally it's worth asking if there's other models that can help us to bring us to the next layer of complexity. All right, and that basically concludes my presentation. Thank you.